the second attack by the killers sent a wave of cold fear sweeping across the city. Within 24 hours after the town got word of the killing, every gun store had sold out of weapons. And by Tuesday morning, May 26th, locksmiths were flooded for orders for new locks, deadbolts, and safety chains as the news of the killing attracted nationwide attention. No motive could be found, and it seemed that the killer might attack anybody he stumbled across. A universal fear spread among the people in this city and surrounding areas. Perhaps everyone secretly or openly wondered, am I, or someone close to me, his next victim? Texarkana looked normal during the daylight hours, but everyone dreaded sundown. Welcome to this week's episode of Two Guys and Some Horror. In this week's episode, we were talking about a film from 1976 based on true events, um, loosely, I would say, especially after doing more, especially after doing more (laughs) research. The film that we're doing, as you just heard in the intro coming in, is The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Um, With me, as always, is my co-host, Clark. Clark, go ahead. Talk to us. Tell us how you're doing today, buddy. That is a Princess Clark now. I have been coronated. There was a coronation that made me a princess over all of this. I don't know. I got nothing. I'm doing great, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Good to talk to you again today. And I'm glad that, um, you know, we we hit over 600 uh, listeners a couple weeks back, obviously, recording this episode now. So you time travelers might be a little confused. But we hit over 600 listens total to the show. So I'm actually super jazzed. Um, I know you're excited. And, yeah, I'm just I'm ready to get in and talk about this movie. Um, do you have anything you want to preface about this movie before I throw some movie information out there? Let's get the information and then let's dig, let's dive into it. Perfect. So this film, like I said, is from 1976. The director is Charles B. Pierce, um, who's also done things like the legend of Boggy Creek, which is a documentary on, um, the, if you don't know what uh, The Legend of Boggy Creek is, please take some time. Go check that out in its separate self. We won't dive into that a whole lot, but it is a lot of fun, especially if you're into looking for creatures like the Loch Ness Monster or Sasquatch or things of that nature. Um, Legend of Boggy Creek is a lot of fun, and um, if you're into it, you'll be really into that. The writer was Earl E. Smith, who also worked with him on The Legend of Boggy Creek, and he also did Sudden Impact. Um, this movie has quite a few stars from back in the 70s that that era of westerns it's got ben johnson andrew prine but the one mm-hmm. star that like popped out to me was dawn wells because she's marianne from Gill- gilligan's island and i thought that, that was oh, really neat yeah that that was her yeah interesting right i did not make that connection because i have not seen gilligan's island in years her face looked familiar and as as i always do i have amazon prime and that's where i was watching it this week uh shout out to amazon prime for having a movie for once that we're watching on the show that isn't an indie film uh and i pulled up the x-ray and x-ray gives you kind of that detail of who it is and i saw where she was from and i was like that's really cool i'm writing that one down for the stars um she doesn't have a big part in the movie but Mm -hmm. you know whatever well she, she has she's the main character and she's probably the one of the best female actors she's the one that screams the very start yeah i just feel like you know, most women in this film don't get a lot of uh i don't know star power or star time so i feel bad uh calling them stars when a lot of them aren't even in the movie for a, a real long amount of time you know what i mean yeah well there's there's really only three three people that you get to see a whole lot well four technically but yeah, you get. We can talk about them later. Uh huh. So the last bit of information that I have here is the budget uh, for this film was four hundred thousand, which seems like quite a bit mm-hmm. in nineteen seventy six for this style yeah. of movie. Um, what is that like a million? It's like one point two, I think, right now, yeah. uh, in comparison. So it's that's a pretty good amount of money, and the movie is well shot. I mean, mm-hmm. for the budget, you're talking the cast that they pulled in. So Captain Morales. <laughs> uh, he was a big name actor at the time, and then you also had Marianne from Gilligan's Island, who I'm assuming, because it was running around the same. No, this was after Gilligan's Island run, so she would have been sought after quite a bit. Probably a little bit more expensive, right, than any other female actress at that time. Um, and then maybe I, I don't know, because yeah. TV is different from uh, from movies, right? Like Especially even back, back then, then, yeah. Even back then, like in the '90s, like, like especially so like if you're on tv chances of you being on the movies is kind of slim today it's a little different but yeah yeah 
And then uh, we had Deputy Norman Ramsey played by Andrew Prine, who personally mm -hmm. I haven't seen um, a lot of his films, but he looked like he had a pretty good tenure in some Westerns and back in the day as well. Um, and then, yeah, so not to deep dive into them too much. Uh, he's but got that swagger. He does. He's got that. He's got that cowboy swagger. He really does. I, I feel like he was one of the shining stars in this movie as well. Um, not to... Him and the Marshal or whatever, whoever the Texas Ranger was. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, Captain Morales and then Deputy Captain Norman. Captain Morales. Yep. Yeah. So the background on this film, like I said, it's loosely based on the 1946 Texarkana Moonlight Murders, um, the crimes that were attributed to uh, the Phantom Killer who was unidentified and was a serial killer back in those days. Um, which is, you know, to me, really, really uh, fun. I like uh, serial killer podcasts. I like shows like Mind Hunters that goes in and really deep dives right. into the mind. Um, what are your thoughts and feelings on this mysterious, unidentified serial killer from 1946? So I, I actually did dig into this a little bit, the background of the, the history, and knowing that there are a lot of things in this film that, that – didn't happen, which I'd like to kind of talk about later, but uh, he, this guy just stopped killing at one point. Like as soon as like the killing started, like they just completely stopped and they never found the guy period, which is probably the best part of the film itself. And I'm going to spoil the ending for you. We don't find anything out about the killer and he is still roaming the streets, which is the scariest part about this film. The rest of it's kind of, like a spaghetti western. Yeah, I want to say. Yeah, I love with that description. With a little bit of Well, it, it is and it's it's kind of mixed between that and uh who's the it's a wonderful life guy. Uh Dick Van Dyke. Is it Dick Van Dyke? I don't remember the It's got a little bit of a mix between like a a 60s sitcom as well as like a spaghetti western. Yeah, I mean, I have to account that to our director and writer a lot, right? Just because yeah. that's pretty much their MO. If you look at their track records, that's what they do. Um, and they do it well. And that's the thing is back in, you know, 1970s, if if you are already in a directorial slot and a, a writer slot and, and you've worked together before, you usually got similar gigs to what you've already been working on. This one just yeah. seems to be a bit of an outlier because, like you said, it's not it's not so much even horror, you know, it is, to me, it's way more of a Western feel. And I loved it. I mean, for that. But when I think about it from the horror perspective, I don't know if I love it or really hate it. I'm kind of in that weird yeah. middle ground. Um, and I'm just, I'm not really sure how to feel about it. But it's I, one of those films that your dad or your mom has running on in the background and you kind of just watched it because it's on the TV, not because you're enjoying watching it, just because it's on. What's so funny is my dad is infamous for being in love with horror movies or uh, horror, I wish, uh, with Westerns. And I mean, he, ever since I was a kid, he's had Louis L'Amour books. I think that's yeah. how you pronounce his name, the writer. Uh, crates, like milk crates full of the of those Western books. He's always got, you know, the Western channel on. When we bought cable the first time uh, when I was a kid, he made sure that the package had a Western channel. You know what I mean? Like, right. so I grew up with uh, Westerns on always in the background. And that's exactly what this feels like. It's like my dad's watching a movie and I'm sitting there and I'm watching it with him. It just so happens to have kind of a horror aspect enough to keep me there. Mm -hmm. Very um, little. Very little. So one thing I definitely want to talk about is just like the opening of this movie because the opening of our episode, I had a little excerpt of the narrator talking and that mm. every time the narrator's, narrator's voice kicked in, I was absolutely charmed. Like it's yeah. it's got that documentary feel that just it it's so good, it's so real. I love it. He matter of factly says things as if this these events are, are real. This whole movie is based on facts. Everything happened. It got him into a lot of trouble though, back in the day. We can get to that more really? later if we want to. Well yeah, just because like the film's tagline, right? So it claimed that the man who killed five people still lurks the streets of Texarkana, Arkansas. So it caused officials for that neighboring city to threaten Pierce over the ads in, back in 1977. I mean, he left it on the posters and just wrote it out. But, like, you got to think you have a whole city of people and you're telling them that the killer still lurks the streets. It's like, should Good he publicity. be able to do that? Should he not? It's great publicity. But 
I, I mean, you got to imagine the fear for like police officers, the sheriff's department, everyone who worked on that, especially. Right. Um, but yeah, it caused it caused some controversy. It was it was good. It was good. I think the uh, main issue I I don't know whenever whenever the uh, the narrator came on, like I was enthralled. Like I would I'd watch and then I kind of lose focus and I kind of fall out, fall out again because a lot of the I don't know a lot of the scenes in this movie they didn't have the draw. Some of the ones like I don't know. We could talk a little bit, but. Like at the very start, when the killer kind of shows up, and the guy's like, I think he's trying to put his arm around her, and she kind of moves away. Marianne moves away, mm -hmm. and he like leans, he lies on her 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 lap to like fall asleep, which happens way too much in this film. I guess that's how they're trying to showcase people making out or, or doing the deed by just lying on girls' laps. Yeah, I mean, they we know what they're really doing back in the day. I mean, they're going to Lover's Lane to make <laughs> out, fool around. No, they're going the to lie on people's laps. <laughs> they just want to get, you know, the back scratches in, okay? They just yeah. they just want those, those light, soft, sensitive, uh, sensory-seeking scratches. You know, that's what they're really there for. They're not there for sex. <laughs> Come on, people. <laughs> Get your head out and of the game. And then you have, uh, you have Jason show up. Uh, Jason part the... two. Yeah. Yep. Jason, Jason yeah, part, from part two. Friday the 13th part two, Jason <laughs> shows up wearing the sack on his head and he breathes in and out and he sucks in the pillow on his head and it keeps going, you know, puffing out and puffing in. He's breathing very hard and he decides to brutally maul these, these teenagers or I don't know if they're teenagers or adults, but he mauls them. And he leaves them alive. Yes. So that that part is is a little confusing to me because is he really? I mean, after that first attack, I guess that's probably why they took it less serious. I guess because he didn't kill anybody, he only you know beat them pretty bad because both are left alive, the boy and the girl. But the girl, but they, they call the 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 captain guy in or. Whatever, whoever this this ranger is, don't they? They do. As a they, end up, of this? they end up calling Captain Morales in. I can't remember if it's after the first one or the second one. To be honest, um, I, I want to say either. I want to say it's after the second one because Deputy Ramsey goes out. This is this is my favorite attack scene. Um, is it the second one the trombone? The second one is not the trombone. That's the third one. Yeah, okay. the second one. Uh, is is when the attack happens in the rain and Deputy Ramsey just kind of had that feeling. He was doing the math and he's like, man, it's been three weeks, 21 days exactly today since our last killing or since our last attack, he says. And then he goes out in the rain and he almost catches the Phantom, right? He was just right. shy. Um, and it's funny because the police officers in the town aren't really taking it that seriously either. You know, he asked him how many units you have. Well, we got four units. Okay, how many of them, can any of them go patrol this area? No, none of them can. It's, you know, they're just too busy. I need you to talk to the captain. And then, plug. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you know what? Let's, um, so, so I'll round out my, my uh, comment about the rain thing and then we'll head over to spark plug because I love it. And, and I don't know if you caught some of the things that were going on, but I, I really liked it. So, so anyways, Deputy Ramsey, you know, he's he's out there in the middle of the rain, it's wet, and he's out there. He's just he knows something's up. Finds the car, the car's left abandoned, he's like, I think someone's been abducted, hears some gunshots, radios it in again, and then he goes trudging on foot with his shotgun through the through the rain and and he's within shooting distance in my opinion. But the narrator says, and this is something I'm curious about your feeling on, um he says Ramsey, Norman Ramsey didn't shoot was close because he knew night, the killer was fire, too far out of reach that day. Was just out of range. He was only carrying Ramsey a 12-gauge shotgun. shotgun. Right? He says something to that. Do you really think that 12-gauge couldn't have popped a tire or, or possibly harmed the killer? Like, I wonder what held him back from shooting. It's so different from other other movies or other scenes depicting similar things where the... the the police officers would definitely have opened fire to try and stop the vehicle, right? So I'm, I mean, I'm just curious your opinion. I don't, I don't know if a gun's going to stop a car in real life, to be to be bluntly honest. And if he hits him, that could cause some property damage. I don't know. Maybe he wasn't sure it was the killer or not, but I don't know if this is what happened in real life either. True. Yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, I guess I'm. I'm just thinking of it I from a movie perspective. There. 
All right. So, well, that's my favorite attack scene, at least, was the second attack with, with Ramsey. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really like that one. So do you want to talk about your favorite scene, or do you want to talk about your favorite character, which is, I think, yeah. Sparkplug? Uh, he's not my favorite character. I just I don't understand why they put him in this movie. It it doesn't. They, it really ruins the tone of the film. If I'm, if I'm supposed to take this film seriously, is this kind of lighthearted? Is it, it feels like it's a mix of both. And then you have the trombone scene, which really just kind of makes it a little weird for me to really put a point on what I want to think about. But okay, so Sparkplug uh, is the director. You know that, right? He he's the I didn't I had no idea. Okay, so I think the so director he makes himself a horse's ass. Yeah, yes, I think the director decided to put himself in this film to be that goofball and change the tone of the movie, which I mean obviously I enjoyed the spark plug scenes because he is so funny. But what I'm was kinda Andy Griffith show? Yeah, I'm kinda like what what is he trying to do here, right? So I really love your perspective on spark plug yeah. because it's good. Well, no, like we get introduced to him and he's threatening to to pop a cap and this lady's dog or something. And then this guy is like, the captain's like, what are you, don't, how long have you been a police officer? Four months. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sure it's been longer than that. No, sir, four months. Don't threaten people. <laughs> yep, and then he, she calls in and he threatens her again. And he leaves. He's really got a grudge yeah. with this lady and the dog. The chief's just shaking his head. So that's our introduction to Sparkplug, who's our who's our idiot, our lovable nincompoop. He is, and he's there. Well, I wanted to be the killer. <laughs> I know you. I wanted him. <laughs> him to be the killer because it would have made sense because he's like a horse's ass, and everybody treats him like garbage. And if that was like the twist of the thing, I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. They all laughed at me. Now I'm laughing at them. Pulls they out all... his trombone. <laughs> they all <laughs> thought I was an idiot. But here I am, 40 years down the road, I'm still the Texarkana killer. Yeah, I mean, that would be a crazy we, twist, right? Let's talk about the uh, the shoes real quick. Um, okay. Because in every scene where we don't see the killer's face, um, and the killer's like in a public area, we see the same shoes, which I believe are being used to symbolize the killer's location. I agree. Like the restaurant when they're having dinner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, even at the end of the movie, the very final scenes of the movie, right? That's when we get also the last pair of shoes that you'll see as he's kind of standing in line, and moving he wherever he's moving. Yeah. What other he scenes has the had same the shoes? Is the killer? I don't know. I think those are the only two. I was gonna say. I think because we also no, we also get the opening scene right with the shoes as he's walking out oh, of the grocery you're... store. You're right. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah, there are a couple scenes where we see some shoes, which is and funny. Then, oh man! Cause and then we just see the killer himself, like uh, in with the, the scene mask, where, right, or with the the potato sack or whatever it is, right? With Jason, um, the Jason <laughs> mask is his favorite movie. Is Friday the Thirteenth, Mister Voorhees. Yeah. <laughs> um. No. What's funny well, anyhow, about? Oh, go ahead. Oh no! You you go. You have a thought. Well, I was going to say, I think it's funny how the the narrator is always panning this, this you know, this entity. You see the shoes, right? It's this right. It's, it's this unknown person. Like, we, we genuinely have never seen the guy's face. I don't even think we saw his hands to know what color skin he even had. Um, but it's the thought that this person, when they do this, is always in the middle of the city listening. He's always around. He's getting... He knows everything about the killer and what the police know because they're telling all that information, right, to the city. Because he's spark plug. It's, <laughs> he is in the precinct. The call is coming from within the house. Um, I just He knows uh, exactly how to how to disguise himself by yeah, saying like an absolute that's moron. So damn interesting. <laughs> Especially because it's based on real stuff. Now Yeah, I, yeah. Oh man. Keep going though. Dude, I I like the Okay, so we're talking about like my favorite scene. I think I, I'm gonna have to say it's it's the train scene, which oh, we'll get here to. Here we go. <laughs> no, we'll bring it now. It. No, just get to it now. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's just like they're they're trying to shoot guns underneath the train and shoot this guy, and that's all they're doing for this entire scene. And I'm yeah. watching them do it, and I see like the train's going like 10 miles per hour, maybe five. 
and it's just slowly moving. And as it's slowly moving, you see a guy who's like in the, the frame of reference from the camera's viewpoint, you see this cameraman wearing like a, a beater shirt and he's holding like this giant camera and he's bigger than the guy shooting underneath the train for at least a, a second and a half. Mm-hmm. And I was like, <laughs> I, just, I just broke out laughing. And as soon as I saw it, I just, I messaged you. I'm like, dude, what the heck? <laughs> it's funny. Cause when I rewatched what? it today, I'm like, Oh God, how did I miss that last time? How it's could so, you miss that? It's so it's obvious. So big. I was like, I was like, and you're like, what? <laughs> so, so I catch right all there. these reaper creatures, right, in in southbound a couple weeks back, but I can't catch the giant ass cameraman on the on the train. <laughs> and what's funny is after you said it, right? So I see the cameraman, it goes right to the shot that he got. It goes right to the shot. It's Captain Morales with the shotgun and he fires through the train and hits the phantom. Like, this is the final act of the movie. Right. This yeah. is this is the end of the movie. They're chasing the Phantom. It's Captain Morales and Deputy Norman Ramsey, and they're almost on the heels of him. And and I think <laughs> this this ending is liberty to Charles Pierce. Like this is not. There's no accuracy at all to this scene, if I remember right. No, no, this, this just, never happened. Right. They just wanted to give the movie a, a good ending, and I think it was a pretty damn good ending for a, for a movie that we know the killer never gets caught. But they hit him. Sure. And they wing him in the lake, and then later on, you know, he still gets away, and that's what we were talking about with him shuffling with the limp, and you saw the shoes, so to connect yeah. all those pieces for the listeners, that's, that's, those are the pieces we're talking about that kind of come together, but that's, that shot... That's the scariest part of the film, is that the that killer's gaff, still out there. That's a bad gaff, and it's still in the film to this day, like, that's, when you guys watch it, listeners, like, just remember, we told you, it's there, it's pretty obvious, and I, Curtis, missed it, Okay. I, I would have it. laughed in the theater. I would have laughed out loud in the theater, and everybody would have la- looked at me like just oh, such a jerk. <laughs> if Alamo ever gets a chance to do this movie, would you go see it with me live in theater? Alamo's bankrupt, dude. Yeah, but they're still open. There's hope. There's hope, uh, man. There's hope. What 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 chapter bankruptcy did they file? What? How many are they closing? I, I think everything in Arizona. Because they're still selling popcorns or whatever, so. I don't Are know. they? I hold I hold up hope. I, I believe in it. I believe in you. I believe in I'll Alamo. Believe in... I think they can figure it out. We're going through <laughs> tough times, man. We are going through tough times. All right, not to uh, dive too much into that. We can get our movie theater popcorn and watch uh, the town that drowned in sundown the sequel next time. I'm gonna get a projector, uh... <laughs> and we're gonna have movie night soon. Soon, when all uh, this, when all this, we'll make is, sure to wear a mask. Is, is done. I mean, I might still wear a mask <laughs> even after people think that it's over, just to be safe. I'll get a bang mask. Friday the 13th, part two, all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we had the the third killing thing that I want to talk about. Okay. This girl, like, it's prom night, and there's these ladies, like, they're spiking the punch, and when one of them is drinking the punch and doing, like, a really goofy look, like, oh, look, these old ladies are spiking the punch. Ha, 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 it's so funny. And then we move on to, like, the band, and this guy takes the band girl who plays the trombone uh, in real life, she played the saxophone, but she uh, he takes her to this like they go out to the woods and they park their car and he like lies on her shoulder and falls asleep or lies on her lap and falls asleep because again we're we're all good Christians and you know they're not married so of course they're not doing anything else just lying on her lap and I guess I'm skipping the stakeout scene right now but I want to talk about that too. Oh, we'll get and there. <laughs> the killer, like they're driving away, and the killer, like, is rips onto the side of the car, and he just he's running super fast, man. That car is going at least thirty miles an hour, and he causes the car to kind of like stop, and he beats the crap out of the guy, and then he ends up tying the girl to a tree, and he attaches a knife to the trombone. And he stabs her while playing the trombone. Uh, it's the pulley piece on the trombone. And every time it goes out, he stabs her. And then he blows on it. And it's just... I don't know. I didn't even notice he was stabbing her the first time I saw this. Because I was like, well, why is she dying when he's playing the trombone? I didn't understand. And the second time watching, I was like, oh, he's... He's stabbing her. 
there's a lot about that kill scene that just seems kind of whatever, like bleh. I, it I was, mean, the build up they, took way too long with that trombone. They took artistic freedom with it. I, I think for the time, it was kind of scary. It was just kind of weird. Yeah, sure. It wasn't I, all yeah. that. That's great. That's a great point. In the seventies, that would have been pretty terrifying, I guess, for anybody to think from a prom staying out late, right? And there could have been a little bit of that there, where they're like playing on the fears of of kids. But I mean, you know, like you mentioned, it wasn't even a prom. She didn't actually play a trombone, and they weren't even dating. They weren't a couple. They were just friends. So all these things, you know, the writer took just so you guys can understand. These are the liberties that the writer would take and kind of, you know, split and pull into a different light well, that's to, hollywood to baby screen. yeah it's hollywood baby um <laughs> yeah. i don't know the the boyfriend not running away fast enough what the hell was his problem don't give me that he was hurt crap you get your butt up your adrenaline's pumping you move it uh roy didn't get away right and then peggy poor peggy oh. that that whole trombone knife thing like i said it just yeah. drew out a little too long for me the even the bill he plays the trombone with the mask on then can't play it when he's using the knife and that that was really yeah. fury like infuriating for me i'm like what what happened to your lips man they worked through the mask earlier and now they don't well you, with the trombone you have to purse them and push them through so mm -hmm. i don't think i don't know if you'd be unable to play it i, I couldn't tell you i, don't know. I know but don't give me a play on one play. yeah don't give me a play on one shot yeah. and no play on the next that's annoying give me the yeah. play with the knife <laughs> Well, and like he bites her breasts and stuff, and they're oh. going into detail of like how what he did, but he didn't have intercourse with the right. bodies or anything. It's like some odd sexual thing with this guy, which you know you don't expect that to to hear that, but not, but also see people just lying on girls' laps. So, I don't know. I mean, this, this is movie... this is only in the film again. Yeah. So, um... I don't know. Well, they, the historical accuracy parts, right? They well, I mean, ch check it out. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> no, no, I know. I'm, I'm yeah. just so that way people understand. Like these, these are still. It's just so weird. The liberties that were taken for the film are still a little bit weird to me when it comes to the historical accuracy. Is just as kind of scary as, you know, what he switched and decided to do in the film. It's still just as, uh, to me, just as scary and could have just been left for historical accuracy. But then again. You can get into, you know, I guess legal issues with that too, right? It's Families like those movies want... based on a true story. Anything based on a true story is not Texas real. Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, that was, yeah. Very loosely based on it. We'll, get there. Loosely. we'll get there eventually. We'll do TCM too before we ever do TCM. I'll, I'll guarantee that. I, I, yeah, I need to give you back TCM, but I think we should talk about spark plug striving okay because he's a, he's a bad driver he's a terrible and driver comedic comedic effect you know he's, he's driving he can't find the keys everybody's like oh this is where we as the viewers realize oh this guy's an idiot he gets the keys and then he turns the, the lights on and he's speeding through and then the guy the captain morales is like oh hold it boy and he stops the car in the middle of the road and the guy's cigar is like bent in half, and he's like, I'm, "I meant slow down, not stop." Hoo hoo hoo. If it's and, an emergency, you use lights, you know, and speed. But otherwise, just drive normal, obey all speed all limits. This, yeah. The street laws. So, yeah, so this man is on the straight and narrow. So we know that as us, as the audience. And after this, we find out that Sparkplug has agreed to be bait for the killer. So he's in drag, and he has fake boobs on, and one of the characters is like, hey, they're, they're lopsided. And he's like, one of these days, Alice, one of these days. And the whole scene is just kind of off-putting with, you know, there's a killer loose, and we have this comedic relief with this guy in drag, and his partner is, like, putting his arm around him. And he's like, I don't know, man. It's goofy. Oh, it's super goofy. And, and the guy... Like, no offense, but the guy, the, the mustached cop who keeps kind of hitting on Running. spark plug and drag. <laughs> he's, he's messing with him, though. I don't know, man. He, he even you after he's been told. Him? I don't know. He went to grab the boob <laughs> and it popped. Like, that, I don't know. It, it's just. <laughs> <They were> balloons. 
I keep I keep saying I don't know because I just really don't understand why he put he his arm keep... around him and he's like, "Hey, yeah. watch it, buddy. Well, he, <laughs> what are you trying kinda, to do?" Kept hinting at him. He's like, "We got to make it seem real." No, no, we don't. I'm not putting my head yep. in your lap. No. <laughs> now give me a kiss, spark plug. Exactly. I was I was a little worried that, but but then again, that's our director. We would have gotten our first kiss scene in the whole movie. I'd Patr- be only... Patrolman A. C. Benson, <laughs> Mister Spark Plug, played by Charles B. Pierce, put himself in that position, and you know what? Maybe that's what he was I think he wanted to be in that position. Yeah. I think he had a crush on that. That I must. I think have... so. I think yeah, so. Man, I. You know what? I will. I don't think this guy's alive anymore, so maybe I shouldn't, you know, throw shade on him in the past. But whatever you're into, man, I'm fine with it. Just, I mean, just be open and real about it. Just own it. Yeah, own it. Let your fleek flag fly. Toot toot. So you talk about spark plug a lot, but you're telling me that's not your favorite character. No, man. It's got to be. A, it's gotta, it's got to be Captain Morales. Oh shoot! We picked the same one again. All right. I want to. Well, he's that's that's kind of what they're he's set up to be. He is the Lone Ranger. I know, but I was torn on Deputy Ramsey or Captain Morales because Ram. Deputy I mean, Ramsey's the 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 chill cowboy type, yeah. and Morales is the uh, get shit done. Hmm. I'm gonna bring him in dead or alive. <laughs> he's the one that's like, yeah, we're not gonna catch this guy. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, do you want my do you want my professional opinion or my off the record, right? Is that what he tells? Off the record, or yeah. he said personal. Personal. And he says yeah. personal, and he says It'll be a miracle. And then they find the car, they find the killer, they shoot at the killer, they hit the killer a couple times. They miss the giant times. cameraman on the back of the train. Thank God. <laughs> they, they miss the cameraman, and killer gets away, and you know we get to the end. Yeah, that's that's kind of the that's kind of the film, except for like you know. Bits and pieces here uh, that I, I mean, that, well, there's the house scene where the killer shows up inside someone's house. And now that's you know, have... actually really interesting because, um, from, from the looks of it, it does seem very, uh, historically accurate with some slight changes, some very slight mm-hmm. changes. So that, that one, you know, when you watch the movie, when you see that one, that seems to be the most realistic, I guess, to the historical accuracy, which is kind of neat. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's the dinner scene with the doctor where Captain Morales is kind of questioning the doctor about psychoanalysis and um, whether he feels this this killer does certain things for certain reasons. And he's just very blunt with him, which I liked. Um, I love when Captain Morales steps off the train and he's like, give me a minute. I'm, I'm going to go buy some cigars and then heads over and buy some cigars at the shop or whatever. Some like, cigars. I, <laughs> I just he, like, I don't know. He grabs man. a handful and he <laughs> yeah. shoves them in his jacket pocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this guy He's... is is good. I really enjoyed that character. That that definitely uh, I I agree with you. My favorite character from the movie. He for got sure. really excited when he got those cigars. I'm gonna get <laughs> me some cigars. Oh man, yeah, yeah. No, he's a lovable character. He he's a he's a cutie patootie. And at the very end, they do the uh, this man decided to search for this kill the chief who we see barely see in the film see him in a couple scenes he's like he decided to hunt him for the rest of his career this guy retired three days later spark plug never really existed (laughs) (laughs) are you shocked on that one (laughs) no yeah i didn't they they don't say anything about him no no i i mean like i said um Overall, He's Barney from the uh, Andy Griffith show. Totally, totally. I mean, he is he is our comedic relief for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, but he's also at the same time he's a lovable goofball. You know, there's no real reason yeah. to dislike him. No real reason to, I guess, Put to him like him either. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have any other notes. I don't have anything else really that I want to talk about this movie. Um, I don't know if you want to summarize anything or if there's anything left over that you want to talk about. Yeah, I don't. This is a this is a movie. It's a movie. It's, it's a hey, it's a movie. The camera guy is my favorite scene. I mean, it, <laughs> it's it's, it's, just, it's like this showdown, and all of a sudden, just the biggest the biggest gaff I've seen in a film. It's it's pretty damn bad. Yeah, I love it. Cool. Well, 
That was the town that dreaded sundown from 1976. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next portion of our show. Um, there, there. This is a real story, man. There's no fun facts or trivia for this, so we're not really going to do that. Um, I think the funly fun fact and trivia is the that gaff, and then the the everything else we've already discussed, like the history of this being a real based off a true story. Yeah, and, and yeah. I would I would pretty much just let the listeners go out and and look for that information on their own. I don't want to just spoon feed them um, what some Wikipedia article says either. You know, let them. We, go ahead. Do we want to talk about the sequel at all? Because. There's there's a huge difference between the two films from what you've told me. I mean, the only thing realistically that I know is that the sequel is more of a horror film than what we get, and it's not following the uh, the, the Texarkana dude. Well, it's not following this documentary style. Um, I watched it a long time ago. That's why I actually picked this one because I wanted to see what the original one was like. To me, hmm. The Town That Dreaded Sundown from 2014 is way more of just a horror movie with less about uh, we're doing some Texarkana, you know, documentary style crime drama western and more of just a straight horror <sighs> film. So, how, I mean, I'm I'm interested in watching that one again one day. How good is it in comparison to uh, The Scarecrow, Night of the Scarecrow? I mean, the movie is, is a much better horror <laughs> film than that, definitely. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I I think we'll have to watch it for the show one day because I think it's I think it's worth it. Yeah, I'm in. I think it's definitely worth it. Well, cool. Curtis, you want to talk about what you've been up to lately? Yes. So, um, I I watched a movie, uh, recently <gasps> that I want to talk really? about real quick. Um, it's called Dead Heat from 1988. So the oh. Mutant Fam, um. And the last drive-in, they did they did this movie um, this past season, and it's it's kind of exciting because I had never seen this movie before and I missed that episode. But holy shit, man, this movie is funny. Um, it's Dead it's definitely heat. got some horror to it, and it's the I guess the best way to describe it is it's literally a horror themed lethal weapon um, mm. starring Joe Piscopo Pis- from Piscopo. SNL. He was in Saturday Night Live. Dead Heat, 1988. What What have you watched or been up to lately, my friend? Oh, man. I've been playing Dark Souls 2, and it's been a joy. It's been a pleasure to just die over and over and over again. I'm almost done with it. This is the... I, I struggle playing like games like this sometimes. Like It took me forever to get started on it. And once I got into it... like kind of mid game like i really got into it i I spent like 67 hours the past two weeks despite covid just wasting my time on this video game and i have to say it's probably one of the best uh, souls us games if anyone who listens plays video games like dark souls 2 you know i got on pc it's scholar of the first and definitely worth it it's a lot of fun just torturing myself and dying and learning and getting better at it it's my kind of game you know what I bought recently during the Steam Summer Sale? Because what? you and Mimic both uh, liked it and had played it. What is that? The Binding of Isaac Rebirth. Oh, yeah. I saw you playing that. Oh, my God. That game is so much fun. It's just like a yeah. mindless shooter. Um, Check out Enter the Gungeon next. Enter the Gungeon? Even okay. Better. It's even better because you can dodge. Hmm. Okay. It'll be on my list. It'll be on my Vish list. All the enemies are, are bullets with guns that shoot bullets. And sometimes it's your gun is a bullet that shoots guns that shoot bullets. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It, it's a great game. Hey, the it can't, it's, it's no worse than, uh, you know, a little kid who's shooting his tears out because he's got mommy issues, right? Oh, man, that game is great, too, but that's just poop and, and pee. It, it really is. It's poop and pee. So if you're into poop and pee horror or uh, horror, uh, poop and pee comedy, there you go. It's right up. Uh, it's right up your alley. Check it out. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with it. It's it's one of those games that I can just put on and play, and and it's just mindless fun when I need a break from uh, real life. All right. Well, that brings us to our social media plugs. Uh, let me throw them out there, and then we'll get this baby wrapped up and get you guys onto the next episode. 
do it. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the number two guys horror pod. Once again, that is the number two guys horror pod on Instagram and on Twitter. You can also email us at two guys and some horror, all spelled out at gmail.com. Um, like I said a couple weeks ago, we dropped an episode um, for Hot Crack Rat where we talked about Southbound, a movie that she suggested we should watch. Um, we could do that for you guys too. So if there's anything that you want us to talk about or watch, uh, we would gladly do it. So come hang out with us. Um, we are wrapping up uh, season two, I guess, in the next couple of months here. So if there's anything yeah. you guys want, let us know. We have up until Halloween planned out currently for the show. Um, if you guys want to throw anything in for the holidays, let us know. Tweet at us. Yeah, I got I got nothing else. There's also going to be a Last Drive-In special in August. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm pretty sure this episode that we're currently recording, uh, yeah, comes out. Today is August 1st, so look for it this month sometime. Um, I'm sure it will be a ton of fun, whatever special it is. So they've done other specials like Christmas. Uh, they've done Thanksgiving specials. And they've done just a, I think, a couple of regular specials. My favorite, personally, Clark, is the Christmas special because they did all of special. all of the Phantasm movies. And at the oh end, my at the end, it's the Twelve Days of Phantasm song, and it is so good, dude. Um, <laughs> it's so good, and and I have way more knowledge about Phantasm now than I've ever wanted to have. Oh, it's so ah, oh, it's good. I we, need to watch. Uh, I really need to rewatch uh, Phantasm too. I unfortunately you can't stream it anywhere. You have to no. actually buy the movie. All right, I'm rambling All at right. this point. Um, We're gonna watch uh, Phantasm and Phantasm Two at some point. Definitely. You, you know, Phantasm's on the list for sure, and well, Phantasm I've... Two can be on the list as soon as you want it to. I don't mind watching oh, well, it for the show. I, you know, have you seen it? I have. I don't. I really don't like it as much as the others. Um, I, but I it was the first one I saw it was Phantasm Two, so I don't know. I think that's where the the tall man stops yelling out "boy" and he actually says his line of "it's never over." But I don't know. I love it. I don't know. I love. The I series. do not know. I know not. So we shall go and say farewell to our friends. <laughs> Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> So it is a documentary style crime drama with, and they've got horror. And I just, I don't agree personally. I don't agree with the horror mark on it. Right.